Well, there's a lot going on in that passage, so let's ask for God's help uh, as we seek to understand his word. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, let your gospel come on to us, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance that with humble, teachable, and obedient hearts, we may receive what you have revealed and do always what you have commanded. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, you have your Bibles with you. Please do uh, keep it open there as we uh, uh, refer to it. But let's have the first picture. As some of you might know, a vacancy has opened up. Of course, the vacancy for the uh, monarch has been already taken, but there's uh, another vacancy in, his, in Her Majesty's, formerly Her Majesty's Secret Service. James Bond, of course, has uh, just retired. So, uh, and the studios are looking for a suitable replacement for Daniel Craig. And as I was reminded this morning in the children's talk, even a woman can apply. Now, what skills would one need in order to be James Bond? I probably wouldn't surprise you that actually we have lots of Bond fans online and they've trolled through the movies and books to even write up a fictional resume. First, to be Bond, they say, uh, you have to be utterly loyal to the crown and to his beloved nation. Bond serves not just himself, but what's best for his country. But devotion to crown and country is not his only trait. He was also very skilled, of course, in many things. He could, for example, expertly drive a car, ride a motorcycle, steer a boat, pilot an aircraft. He can ski, he can climb mountains, he can scuba dive, as well as jump out of a plane. Parachutes are optional. He's uh, an expert marksman. He's competent in many forms of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Plus, his resume is several pages long, of course. Uh, plus, he's uh, multilingual, too. He's fluent in Italian, in French, in German, in Russian, in Mandarin, and even in Japanese. Oh, and there's a little footnote that says he's also good at card games, and he drinks moderately. Some of you are thinking, well, card games, I can do card games. Well, what can he not do? Well, his fictional resume also did note that he can often be impulsive, hot-tempered, tends to destroy office equipment that's been supplied to him, and bad at keeping long-term relationships. But you're thinking, well, what does this Bond, we can take his picture off, what does uh, Bond have to do with our text today? Well, did you know that all Christians are also called to serve the crown? Uh, except in our case, it's the king of kings, the sovereign ruler and creator of the universe. We too, actually, are in his majesty's service. We too are called not to live for ourselves, but for the good of others. Yet unlike Bond, we don't need to have Olympian fitness, be multilingual, or be an expert in anything and everything. All Christians can serve our king here and now, just as we are today. How? Well, you can see from our passage in verse 20, Paul there says, we are therefore God's Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Now, of course, an ambassador is not a secret agent, isn't it? Ambassadors don't hide who they are or who they represent to others. Ambassadors openly, intentionally represent their monarch and nation at all times and in all places. And that's what all Christians are called to be. But how do we get to be ambassadors? What ought to motivate us and guide our actions? And the word therefore in verse 20 here is key. You see, the word therefore is a connecting word, is a, is a conjunction. It links two ideas together, two sentences, two clauses together. And so the word therefore that appears in verse 20 actually points us back to something prior. And that something prior, one of the key things, is found in verses 14 and 15. It says there in the first part of the sentence, uh, in verse 14, uh, it talks about how for Christ's love compels us. But look at the next part. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. You see, everything else around our text is actually linked to this fundamental truth in verses 14 and 15. If we can have the second slide, 
so they can have a roadmap of where we're going this morning. So we begin by looking at this central truth in verses 14 and 15 as to what truth are we living on? What truth was Paul uh, saying that they should base their lives on? And his answer is that the gospel is a sure foundation. But then we look back at verses 9 to 13. Well, what drives them forward then towards this truth? Or what are the things that will hold them back, that would hinder them from fulfilling these truths? And finally, we will look at the, the next segment from verses 16 to 20. How does this calling change us? How does this truth transform us? How does this new life mission uh, transform the way that we look at others around us? So that's where we're going. That's our roadmap for this morning. Thank you for the slides. So what truth are we building our lives on? And we begin by looking at verses 14 and 15. Now what we believe about life, of course, matters. It matters a lot because it determines the choices and the actions that we make. You will choose one thing and not another. You will do one thing and not another based on what you think are the fundamental truths of how the world works. Now what truths did Paul built his life on. You can see that again in verses 14 and 15. We are convinced, he's convinced, that one died for all and therefore all died. Now this is the heart of the good news of Jesus as we've been hearing in our series, Lift High the Cross. Now notice that through these verses, actually Paul refers to Jesus not by his name, but by his title. Throughout this passage, Jesus is referred to as Christ, the Christ. Christ, of course, is the Greek for the Hebrew word Messiah, meaning God's promised chosen one who will rescue all his people and will be with them forever. Now, how did he rescue? And it's found in that little phrase, one died for all, therefore all died. And this is where Christianity stands apart from all other religions. One died for all. You see, in all other religions, Mankind is expected to die for their God or their gods. They're expected to pierce themselves as a sign of their devotion. Some think that they need to blow themselves up in the midst of their enemies, but not Christianity. For Christians, it's not that all of us died for one. For Christianity, is that one died for all. How does that make sense? Well, it happens more often than we think, isn't it? As I said, uh, previously, it happens all the time in the Olympics. One national champion is chosen to represent our country, and when they win, the whole country wins. And that is what Jesus did for us. He died so that we don't have to. But some are thinking, well, why did we have to die in God's judgment? Well, again and again, the Bible reveals that's what justice demands. For example, when we are wronged, when we are sinned against, we want a pound of flesh, as, uh, as Shakespeare puts it. Uh, we demand that the other person pays for their wrongdoings, isn't it? We don't just let them walk away free of any consequences, and if they do, we don't feel happy about it. We feel that somehow the world is wrong. And payment is demanded, the payment demanded usually depends on the seriousness of the wrongdoing. A small fine, to pay for speeding, but life imprisonment or death is instead meted out for murder. Now, Jesus' death often doesn't make sense to us because we often dismiss the seriousness of our wrongdoings against God. And Jesus reveal, reveals how God sees our sins, for example, in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel. So you can go back and read that in Matthew uh, chapter 5, 6, and 7. So what truth this morning, I wonder, what truth is your life, is my life built upon? Are you utterly convinced that one died for all? Is that true for you? This matters because it's only when we are truly convinced of this that genuine transformation will begin. It is because of this that Paul now sees his life as no longer his own. He was formerly if you like, a, a prisoner on death row, but now somehow someone else has paid for his sins, and so now he owes his new life to this person who freed him. So what does believing this truth look like in practice? Well, we discover more of this 
as we turn back to, say, verses 9 to 13 at the beginning of uh, this passage, this reading in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. Let me read to you, for example, uh, verses 9, and, and, and then we skip to verse 10. So we make it our goal to please him. This is what drives Paul now. So we make it our goal to please him. Verse 9, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may receive what is due for us for things done while in the body, whether good or bad. You see, in other words, because our lives are no longer our own, we don't live to please ourselves anymore, but to please him. Paul also reveals that all peoples everywhere will one day be held accountable by God for all that we say, we think, we do, or things that we didn't say, didn't do. Has it been pleasing to him? Yet Christians don't approach Judgment Day, of course, with doubt and despair. Why? Because we trust in what Jesus has done for us. But because Jesus has done something for us, died for our sins, doesn't mean that now there's nothing left for us to do. For Christians, Judgment Day is not so much about punishment, but about reward. In verse 11, he says, Paul then says, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. What does he try to do? How does he orientate his life now? He says, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. You look at the next phrase, we try to persuade others. What is Paul directing all his energies toward? To persuade others of the gospel, of the good news. Another way of saying that is to evangelize, to proclaim the name of Jesus to those who are lost. Now, you see, when, once you mention the word evangelize, some of us have allergic reaction to it. It's like, oh, no, 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 that's not me, isn't it? It's not me. I, I can't convert people. I, I, I can't evangelize. That's for some other expert, some other committed Christians to do so. And I suspect many Christians shy away from doing evangelism because we misunderstand what it is. Many people often confuse the fruits of evangelism, which are converts, with the act of evangelism, which is the proclamation, the sharing. We confuse the fruit uh, with the act. Distinguished theologian, for example, Dr. J.A. Packer, he puts it this way in his book, evangelism and the sovereignty of God, and you can find a copy of it in our church library. He says this, he says, according to the New Testament, evangelism is just preaching the evangel, the gospel. It is a work of communication in which Christians make themselves mouthpieces for God's message of mercy to sinners. Or, as Paul puts it here, ambassadors. Dr. Packer goes on to say in his book, the way to tell whether, in fact, you are evangelizing is not to ask whether conversions are known to have resulted from your witness. It is to ask whether you are faithfully making known the gospel message. You see, it is the act of proclaiming. In other words, content and not converts is the key. Now, of course, uh, we long to have converts, but as far as our responsibility, it is content. You see, conversion is the work of God. Evangelism is the work for the church. Conversion is the work of God, but evangelism is the work for the individual Christian and for the church. This means evangelism can be happening even when no one seems to be converted at this point in time. And this ought to take some of the fear and pressure off us. We share the gospel not to meet some divine KPI, some key performance index for conversions. Uh, but, you know, so like when you appear before the judgment seat of Christ, uh, Christ, I will meet with Christ, and he's going to look at me and says, Marvin, how many have you converted? What can you show? I'm like, even my children's talk didn't go well this morning, you know. So it's not about your convert you converting people. We share the gospel out of the privilege and delight of being entrusted with this monumental, life-changing, world-transforming news. That's what drove Paul forward to evangelize in his fear of the Lord. And by the way, biblical fear is not some paralyzing emotion seeking to avoid God at 
uh, at all costs, but a reverent humility towards him. And it is this fear that enables him to overcome, if you like, a fear of man. And that's how all fears work, actually. A greater fear often replaces and overcomes a lesser fear. For example, a person might be afraid of water, aqua phobia, uh, but that person can overcome their fear of water when his baby falls into the swimming pool. How is this fear of the fear of God related to evangelism? Well, consider this. What often holds us back from sharing the gospel with others? What often holds us back? And I think of myself, what often holds me back? Often it is a fear, a fear tied to how I think other people might respond to me. Will they mock me? Will they think I'm odd? Will they somehow think less of me? Will they shun me? Will they stop talking to me? Now, we don't want that, isn't it? We, all of us want to be well thought of and popular and accepted. But Paul, however, doesn't seem to be that as concerned with how other people think of him. You look at verses 12 and, and then go on to 13, 14. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again. That's what he says in verse 12. Verse 13, if we are out of our minds, as some might say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you, for, the, for Christ's love compels us. And love sometimes seems like that, isn't it? You know, outsiders looking in and they, they think that the lovers, the pair of lovers, you know, they're out of their minds. For example, I, I, I just remember we hear stories uh, of, of someone proposing to someone else in marriage in public uh, and they're singing and dancing flash mob style. Uh, and, this, and this week, and I was, when I was uh, thinking about that, there's even a website that compiles that, uh, 12 best flash mob proposals ever done. You can Google that, no pressure. No pressure, Wing Lung Sudak Gawin, it's okay. So, but, um, but now to outsiders looking in, when you look at something like that, that happens, you know, this kind of flash mob, and then like this proposal that's going to happen, it just looks over the top. You know, it looks a bit crazy, it looks out of their minds. But you see, here's the thing. The man in the video that was doing that, he doesn't care. Why? He's not proposing to you, isn't it? He's not proposing to you. You are not his audience. It is his love for his beloved that overcome his fear of public humiliation. You see, for Paul, it is his fear of God and his experience of the love of God that drove him forward to proclaim God, to evangelize. And that means the opposite is also true. How so? Well, it's often our fear of man instead of fear of God and our lukewarm experience of the love of God that hinders our evangelism. Well, some might say, okay, okay, we hear you. We need to share the gospel, but how? You know, we're not trained. We don't know what to say. What if nobody listens to us? You know, we have all these kinds of fears bubble up to the surface, isn't it? By the way, this is, this is exactly the kind of conversation that Moses had with God when God called him to lead Israel out of Egypt. And you can read that in Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 to chapter 4. Consider, for example, Moses' conversation. I'm going to highlight it to you uh, now on the, on the screen. Moses had five excuses of why he should, is the wrong person to speak, to speak about God to Israel. And his first excuse is found in chapter 3 of Exodus, verse 11. He says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? In other words, I am a nobody. Who am I that, that Pharaoh, this great king, will pay attention to me? Uh, God's answer in Verse 12 of chapter 3, Exodus, I will be with you. In other words, I am the somebody who will accompany you, the nobody. His next excuse, Moses doesn't give up, of course. He's quite persistent. In verse 13, he says, suppose I go and they ask me, well, what is your name? So that's excuse number two. In other words, he's saying, well, actually, I don't know you very well. God's answer, well, this is what you are to say. In other words, I am going to reveal myself to you. 
But then Moses goes on in Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. He says, well, what if they don't believe me? What if I go and they don't believe me? I can't persuade anyone. And that's excuse number three. Well, God's answer then, if we had excuse number three, they won't believe me. God's answer in Exodus chapter 4, verses 3 to 5, and it, it has this kind of uh, progression. Throw your staff down onto the ground and I will turn it into a snake and then put your hand into your robe, etc. In other words, what God is showing him is you don't rely on your own power, Moses, to do this. You are relying on my power. But then Moses goes on in his conversation with God, this back and forth. In Exodus 4 verse 10, he goes on and says, Pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent. I am slow of speech and tongue. In other words, he's saying, I'm not a good speaker. God's answer is who gave human beings their mouths? Go and I will help you speak and teach you what to say. Exodus 4 verses 11 to 12. In other words, God can still use you despite what you think are your weaknesses. But then here's the kicker. Excuse number five, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Send them. Send Marvin, not me. Sounds familiar, isn't it? There's a bit of a Moses in all of us. So that's the good news and the bad news. And God's answer is, Aaron will speak to the people for you, but you shall speak to Aaron and put words in his mouth. In other words, Moses, you're not getting away from your responsibility. You still have to tell somebody. God will send someone to accompany you along the way. Now, we keep the slides there. If we can keep that slide there. Friends, when we talk about the theme of evangelism this morning and this year, I wonder what might be your excuse. I'm a nobody. I don't know God well. The other people won't believe me. I'm not a good speaker. Send them, not me. Well, friends, listen to God's answer to Moses because it's God's answer to you as well. I'm a nobody. God says, I will be with you. I don't know you well. God says, I will reveal myself to you. They won't believe me. God says, you rely on my power, not your own. I'm not a good speaker. God says, I will teach you and can use you. And we say, send them, not me. God says, I will send others to go with you. You see, friends, too often we fear evangelism because we look at it as some kind of high-stakes solo event that you get one shot at it, and you have to do it on your own, and if you mess it up, and that's it, some person's eternal destiny is lost. But actually, it's a process. It's not a one-off event, and it's a team sport. If we look at the next slide, for example, the Rev Reverend Tim Keller, uh, a Presbyterian minister in New York City, he gave these 10 suggestions as to what it might look like. I know the, the words are a little bit small, so you can listen. He says, well, this is like the process. It's not a one-off event. It's a process. There's a, there's, a, there's a list of things that you can do, starting with, number one, this is the low-hanging fruit. Let people around you know that you are a Christian. That's the very first step. Do people around us know that we are Christian? You're not, remember, you're not a secret agent. But anyway, everyone knows who James Bond is, so he's not a very good secret agent. But you're not a secret agent. You're an ambassador. Let people around you know that you are Christian. Of course, in a natural, unforced way. But the second step is perhaps to listen. Ask friends about their faith and just listen. We all have friends, don't we? We all have people around us that we work with. What, what do they believe? Number three... Keller says, well, listen to your friend's problem and maybe offer to pray for them. Number four, he says, well, you can share your problems and testify how God has helped you with it. 
as well. So it's a conversation. Number five, he says, well, then you can perhaps give them a book to read. Number six, you can share your story, uh, share what we call your testimony. Number seven, perhaps they might have questions and objections that you can be able to address. Even if you can't address, someone else can address. Uh, some book you can loan them. Number eight, you can invite them to a church event. Number nine, offer to read the Bible with them. See, it gets progressively scarier uh, for you. Number 10, take them to an explore course. You see, generally, uh, Reverend Keller says, we start with one to four. Let people know, ask them about their faith, listen to their problems, offer to pray for them. You can talk about your life and how God has helped you. And if people are interested and want to talk more, you can move on to five to seven. Give them a book, share your story, testimony, answer their questions. Sometimes, you might meet someone that wants to go straight to 10 and they're ready to come to a church event and go to an explore course. But most people start way back. And for most people to get to 8 to 10, we have to work at 1 to 4. And sometimes you might need to go through the loop a few times. But all of this presupposes uh, this intentional engagement with people around us to build relationships. Oftentimes, evangelism is harder, not for new Christians, but for older ones. You know, older not as in your chronological age, older as in your Christian age. The longer you've been a Christian, you discover, as I've discovered, the longer you've, uh, become a, that you've been a Christian, the less non-Christians you know. Well, what then? Well, this is where the whole church can work together because new believers tend to have all the connections with non-believers. New believers have all the connections with non-believers, but they might not have all the skill to articulate it. Mature believers, on the other hand, have all the skill to articulate it, but you have no one to say it to. And so what must we do? We should work together. Everyone has a role to play in evangelism in the church. Some can be connectors, some can be bringers, others can be teachers and mentors and disciples. And so Reverend Keller says, in every healthy church, you ought to be, one must be either a seeker, a bringer, a discipler, or you're a dead weight. Which one might you be? Thank you. Well, that's why at St. Andrew's, We've introduced last year, and we want to continue this year with our Hope Explored and our Christianity Explored courses. It's a Bible-based course that seeks to explain the gospel to non-believers. And what we, what we want you to do, and we want to invite you to pray for this, we want to invite you to invite others to join, for you to join, and perhaps even for you to teach. You don't need to know everything about the Bible before you can do so. And that is how everyone and St. Andrews can work together to evangelize the lost. That's why things like Hope Explored and Christianity Explored are being introduced. Now, of course, we now turn to the, the last question, uh, looking at verses 16 to 20. How does this gospel calling change us? Well, to reach the lost, we actually also have to change how we see the lost. One of the other common hindrance to evangelism is actually to see other people as a lost cause, that they're not worth our time and effort to share the gospel with. That, that's the kind of attitude that the prophet Jonah had towards Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria, Israel's mortal enemy. But not so for Paul. You look down at verses 16 to 19. He says, from now on, so it's after verses 14 and 15, uh, where one died for all. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to us, the message of reconciliation. Not counting people's sins against them. That's, that's me. That's you. We were once sinners, and yet God didn't count my sin against me to disqualify me from hearing the gospel. 
In other words, no one is unworthy to hear the good news. No one is unchangeable by the good news. Everyone can be made new. Anyone can be reconciled to God. How do we know this? You've experienced it if you're a Christian here today. We too were reconciled to God through Christ in verse 18 because in verse 19, God did not count my sins, your sins, against us as being unworthy to hear or receive the gospel, which leads us back to where we began. So God calls all Christians to be his ambassadors. When should you report for duty? Today is the day, not tomorrow. 2 Corinthians in chapter 6, the last two verses, makes that clear. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, in the day of salvation I helped you, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor, now is the day of of salvation. So friends, if you're listening today and you're not a believer, now is the day of salvation. We want to invite you to build your life on the solid foundation of Jesus, the one who died for all. As Paul wrote in verse 21 of chapter 5, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. But on the other hand, for believers who are hearing this today, Paul urges us in chapter 6 not to receive God's grace in vain. Remember, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And ambassadors are not secret agents. We don't keep our identity secret from others. Ambassadors are people who have been reconciled with God and now in turn are tasked to proclaim God's message of reconciliation with others. And this is our mission. Given by the King of Kings, we are now to serve as ministers of reconciliation in his cabinet, to be peacemakers at large. So don't leave for tomorrow what we should start today. And we pray that our fear of God will overcome our fear of man. That the love of God may transform and deepen our love for our fellow men. And that God's great name may be proclaimed through all the earth, through us, from today onwards until he comes again. Let's pray that. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we pray that you forgive us for our, how often we fear men more than we fear God. And how often we yearn to please others rather than to please you. And we ask for your forgiveness and for your strength. We ask, Lord, that you open our eyes that we might see and experience more of your love for us in a true way. And so that our fear of you will overcome our fear of our fellow men. That our love that we receive from you will transform and deepen our love for our fellow men. And so that your great name may be proclaimed in all the earth, starting here, starting today, even in small ways. Help us, O oh Lord, to bring these prayers into fruition by your Spirit through your Son, until he comes again. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.